My guest this morning is Bob Kendrick, actually Dr. Bob Kendrick, and he is the president of the National League Baseball Museum. In March 2011, that was founded, and in 1990, the NLBM, that's the National League Baseball Museum, is the world's only museum dedicated to preserving and celebrating the rich history of African-American baseball and its profound impact on the social advancement of America. Kendrick's appointment as president marked a celebrated return to the NLBM after a 13-month departure. He became the museum's first director of marketing in 1998 and was named vice president of marketing in 2009 before accepting the post as executive director of the National Sports Center for the Disabled Kansas City in 2010. Kendrick is responsible for the museum's day-to-day operations and the development and implementations of strategies to advance the mission of the 501c3 not-for-profit organization. Since rejoining the NLBM in 2011, he has helped orchestrate nearly $20 million turnaround that has helped the NLBM regain its vital and financial stability. Kendrick began his association with the NLBM as a volunteer during his 10-year newspaper career with the Kansas City Star. As senior copywriter for the Star's promotions department, he won or was part of the creative team that won numerous local and regional advertising and marketing awards. He developed the advertising concept and campaign that helped attract more than 10,000 people in less than 30 days to see the debut of the museum's first traveling exhibit in the summer of 1993. The success of that promotion led to the appointment to the museum's board of directors in the fall of 93. In his nearly five years on the museum's board, and after he's more than that now, Kendrick served as secretary, treasurer, and chaired the membership and event planning committee. He was co-chairman of the museum's grand opening gala celebration that attracted nearly 2,000 people to Bartle Hall in November of 97. The event raised more than 500,000 in support of the NLBM. Kendrick has been responsible for the creation of several signature museum educational programs and events, including the Hall of Game, which annually honors former Major League Baseball greats who played the game in the spirit and signature and style of the Negro Leagues. And while he doesn't fashion himself to be a historian, Kendrick has become one of the leading authorities on the topic of Negro Leagues baseball history and its connection to issues relating to sports, race, and diversity. He has been a contributing writer for Ebony Magazine and the National Urban League's Opportunity Magazine. In 2006, oh my goodness, I'm seeing something here as I'm getting when I get to it. In 2006, the Creator Kansas City Black Chamber of Commerce awarded him the Mary Alona Diversity Award, and he was called a Citizen of the Year by the Omicron Xi chapter of Omega Psi Phi Fraternity in 2009. The Kansas City Globe named Kendrick to the paper's list of 100 most influential African Americans in Greater Kansas City. In January 2014, Kendrick was inducted into the Missouri Sports Hall of Fame. The Kansas City Call newspaper named him the Person of the Year in 2020. In 2021, the Beta Lambda chapter of the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity, that's what caught my eye, named him Business Person of the Year, and he was bestowed honorary doctorate degrees from Jetson University and William Jewell College, respectively, in 2021. A native of Crawfordville, Georgia, Kendrick received a basketball scholarship to attend Park College, Parkville, Maryland, or Missouri in 1980 and earned a BA degree in communication arts in 1985. Dr. Bob, good morning and welcome to the microphones of the Reading Circle with Mark Medley. Hey, good morning, Mark, and thanks so much, man, for having me on. And let me warn the audience now that I am far more impressive on paper than I am in person, but it's still <laughs> good to be with you. I know that's right. And let me tell you why, Dr. Bob, I like to read the whole thing, because it is my hope that as the listening audience, as they listen to that, that in their minds and spirits, something will say whatever it is that they're wanting to do or trying to do or hoping to do. Something can say if that can happen for Dr. Bob, it can happen for me. And so I, I, I wholeheartedly agree because, you know, you mentioned that I am from Crawfordville, Georgia. And Mark, Crawfordville, Georgia, is about 80 miles east of Atlanta, 50 miles west of Augusta, and it's all of 500 people. So, you know, we're talking about a kid who grew up in a rural community, uh, um, very humbling origins, 
And, and so you're absolutely right. I hope it does send a message that, you know, good things can happen no matter where you're from, no matter where you are, who you are, you know, if you put your heart, mind, and soul to it. And so I've been very fortunate and very blessed on this journey that I've embarked on that has given me an opportunity to meet some of the most amazing people uh, in the world that, honestly, as a kid growing up in small town Georgia, I never, ever dreamt possible. And, and so I'm a testimony to, you know, what faith in that journey is all about. I know that's right. Now, see, you just said, you said, <clears throat> excuse me, Crawfordsville, correct? Uh, Crawfordville, huh? Okay, now, I literally just came back on Wednesday from Louisville, Georgia, because that's where my mom is. My mom lives in Louisville. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's a bunch. There's a bunch of, as we say in the country, little bitty towns in Georgia, that's for sure. <laughs> that's right. So she's about 35 miles outside of Augusta. Because that's whenever okay. whenever I fly yep. in, I fly into the, the, the Augusta Regional Airport, and it's about 35 miles from the airport to her house. So, okay. So, yeah, when you start talking those little vills, I understand what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so I tell you what, so why don't we pick up there then? How did you now, because uh, I just read your bio and I see you have the BA in communication arts, of which that's again, we have kindred spirits there because uh, I have one of my degrees is in communication arts as well. And so how did this, you know, how did this, this whole bio that I just read kind of walk us through how this came about? And then I want to work our way into the uh museum because you, well this is not going to be a surprise to you but there are still many people out here who don't know the negro leagues oh, yeah. existed yeah no absolutely and no less to the magnitude in which they did exist and i, and I think that's the, the value of having a negro league baseball museum this is a relatively new history for the more majority of people who encounter us and they are absolutely blown away uh, by what they learned, and to be honest, Mark, I think a little bit dismayed by the fact that they just now had an opportunity to learn it. You do go to the museum questioning, why didn't I know this when I was in school? And, and we know the answer. Uh, the answer is the fact that American historians have done us all a tremendous disservice. They kept this wonderful piece of baseball and Americana away from us, so countless generations of us... <laughs> have gone through our own formal education without knowing one of the significant, most significant chapters, not in baseball history, but in American history. So it is an awakening for most of the people who come to see us. Now, we've done a great job over the last three decades of helping people understand that a Negro Leagues existed and what this story is all about. You know, my, my real... I guess, introduction to the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum began in 1993 as a volunteer, as the bio said, who knew that you go from being a volunteer to ultimately trying to run this institution, an institution that I just absolutely fell in love with. I fell in love with the story, and I fell in love with the remarkable athletes who made this story. And I considered myself to be a baseball fan as a kid growing up in Georgia uh, I'm a lifelong Atlanta Braves fan, and Henry Aaron, the late, great Henry Aaron, is my all-time favorite baseball player and, quite frankly, was my childhood idol. And so I'd been a baseball fan, and then I was being introduced to this story that I had no idea about, and I became almost engrossed in it. I wanted to learn as much as I could, and, man, I didn't want to keep it to myself. I wanted everybody else to feel the same way that I felt about this this wonderful piece of history that I was being introduced to, and then I started to meet the players. And uh, their spirit, Mark, was captivating because I think most people would agree with me. Had they been bitter, we all would have said, you had every right to be bitter uh, about the things that transpired in their lives as they were trying to play baseball in this country. But to a person that I ever met, not one of them, ever expressed any ill will or bitterness toward anyone who may have attempted to perpetrate something against them as they were trying to play baseball in this country. Now, they didn't necessarily like things that were happening to them as they were traveling the highways and byways of the country trying to play baseball, but they would never let it harden their heart with hate. And I just found that to be an amazing and endearing spirit. No, absolutely, because... First off, you're absolutely right. And as I said, I actually am, as I'm doing this interview here in the studio, I have on my black socks, my Baltimore black socks cap. And matter of fact, I'm going to take it off for a minute because on the back of it, you have Discover Greatness. 
The Baltimore uh-huh. Black Sox established 1923, and then on the bill says Negro Leagues, um, and then the back on the flap is NLBM. I just, like I told you, I was just on vacation, and as I went through the various stores and on the airplanes, I, it was amazing how many people had no idea these teams or the league existed. Matter of fact, one guy, because I was wearing a Steelers mask, Pittsburgh Steelers mask, and I was wearing the Baltimore Black Sox hat, and he thought this was a Baltimore Ravens hat. <laughs> he, th- he thought it was Baltimore. I said, no, it's the Baltimore Black Sox, a part of the Negro League. So it really is a lot of education that must occur and is occurring. And that's why what really it came to my attention is on Facebook. And so I started seeing your posts and everything on Twitter and Facebook. And I looked up the museum myself and became a member. And then I have the mug and, and so forth and so on. I ordered I already had the Kansas City Monarchs jersey that I already had in my possession. And again, when I wear that, people get, when they see the big K in the C, they don't know what it stands for. It's like, well, what? I have to go into the explanation again. So wearing the paraphernalia is a great way to begin teaching. And that's why even on the show this morning, uh, for the listening audience, who many out there may not even be aware that there was a Negro League, I'm hoping it will be an education for them. And by the end of the um, show, you have an opportunity to share all the websites and everything, how people can become a member of the NLBM or if they want to donate to it or what have you. But yeah, go ahead in terms of like moving from like when you got this, like because you, you work for the newspaper uh the kansas city globe and and then you know so forth and so on so kind of keep walking us through and then like i said we'll get in and i want to hear some of the players you met because where i'm from i have met one because he's from my hometown of patterson new jersey and that's larry doby oh man yeah well you met a great one (laughs) you met a great one and uh, you know i got a chance to meet mr doby before he passed away as well and What a true gentleman and really, in many respects, the forgotten man. Yes. And, and, you know, that's how we are in our society. And for those who may not uh, may not be familiar with Larry Doby's role, his very much pioneering role in our game. Larry Doby would integrate the American League literally just weeks after Jackie Robinson breaks the color barrier with the Brooklyn Dodgers in 1947. And as we typically do in our society, we celebrate the first. We rarely ever even acknowledge or remember the second. And for black folks in this country, Jackie Robinson's breaking on the breaking of the color barrier was equivalent to Neil, uh, to Neil Armstrong landing on the moon. Correct. And we, we oftentimes refer to Larry Doby as our Buzz Aldrin. The second man. That's the right. Man that nobody ever remembers. <laughs> That's like, right. He has to do a trivia question. And, and quite frankly, Larry Doby went through just as much, and some may even argue even more than Jackie because he was playing in Cleveland, which certainly had black folks, but was not nearly as urban, a, or as, a, as not nearly as much of an urban center as Brooklyn was. And the national media was following Jackie, and they were, really weren't paying Larry Doby attention and Larry Doby folks was 23 years old thrown into a powder keg of racism Larry Doby never played a day in the minor leagues he went straight from the Newark Eagles over to Cleveland and the very next year he would help Cleveland win his last World Series 1948 Larry Doby and the great Satchel Paige and when Larry Doby walked into the Cleveland Indians locker room no one would shake his hand. No wow. player wanted to warm up with him. That's your welcoming to the major league. So it was challenging for not only Jackie, but every one of those players, particularly those who broke the color barrier with their respective major league teams. They, they were outcasts. Nobody wanted them to be there. And, and fear governed a lot of this, Mark, because, uh, and I think just as much as the social conditions of our time, fear was as prevalent as anything because when Jackie came up and when Larry came up, they took somebody's job. And right. They took the job of a friend. And so now the other guys are looking over their shoulder wondering, am I next? And, and so that's why there was such a cold treatment to these players because, honestly, they were afraid. And, again, a lot of these players in Major League Baseball certainly were from the Deep South, and, you know, you're governed by everything that you've heard. So there's always these stereotypical depiction of these ball players and what they're all about. And then, 
you get a Jackie Robinson and a Larry Doby who completely defied any of those stereotypical depictions of African-American ball players or African-Americans in general. And so Larry Doby is an amazing story, and I'm so excited that there in Patterson, they are restoring Hitchliff Stadium. Correct. Uh, where Larry Doby and Monty Irvin and so many great stars from the Negro Leagues call home for so many years, and we're super excited about that and looking forward to being a part of that. And so, you know, that's a long-winded way to get back to your question of working at the Kansas City Star when I just happen to be at the right place at the right time. And I'm working in the promotions department, which functions as the paper's in-house advertising agency. And so I drew the assignment of promoting the museum's first ever traveling exhibition called Discover Greatness. That was 1993. Believe it or not, the exhibit is on display at the Yogi Berra Museum there in Montclair, New Jersey, right now. All right. I'm going to have to get up there uh, because I live like maybe 15 minutes, no, 10 minutes from the Yogi Berra Museum. (laughs) Yes, and they are back open again, and they've had it for now. Almost by the time it's all by the time they finish that run, they'll be there for about two years uh, because obviously it was interrupted by the pandemic. But we've right. been able to extend the stay for them, and it was playing to rave reviews before the pandemic hit. I went up uh, in 2019 to be there for the opening of the exhibit and to do a Q and A uh, there at, at Yogi's place and. Uh, I'm excited that the exhibit is still traveling, but that was my introduction in 1993 to put the campaign together to try and get people to come to an area in Kansas City known as Historic 18th and Vine, where we were building this museum, this fledgling museum. And 18th and Vine, like a lot of urban areas, had died. It had been left abandoned. Right. And here we come, you know, here we come, this little small museum saying, we're going to build a museum here. And not only are we going to build this museum and preserve this history, we are going to resurrect this once very proud, prominent African-American community. Now, I don't know if any of us figured out how we were going to do it, but that was our charge, and we stuck to it. And here we are now, three decades later, recognized as America's national Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. And 18th and Vine is very much alive and well. People are... They are living and they're working, they're playing there at 18th and Vine again. And so, in essence, we've done for that community what Negro League Baseball did for urban communities across this country. Wherever you had successful black baseball, you typically had thriving black economies. And so there was an inherent responsibility to not be self-serving, to not just worry about our own existence but to bring the community alongside us. And so, yeah, I go from being a volunteer man to now trying to run this organization. And I, I didn't see that coming. There is no way right. to see that coming. You know, I just wanted to be a part of the organization. I wanted to contribute to it in any way that I could, whether it was financial, whether it was with time, talent, whatever I could to get this organization moving. And, you know, I never dreamt, that it would turn into an opportunity where I would one day be responsible for leading this organization. But it has been an amazing journey. I know. And while I have you, let me pause for a second. And I meant to do this earlier to congratulate you on the doctorate because I saw whenever, like I said, on social media, on the social media posts, whenever you had earned, was awarded the doctorate. And so let me congratulate you on that as well. Oh, man, thank you. Thank you. I, I, I'm still amazed. Because as, I, <laughs> as, as, as I told some folks, you're talking to a kid who graduated. Thank you, Lottie. <laughs> you know, and, and now someone wants to give you, you know, honorary doctorate degrees for, you know, what they believe you contributed to the communities and to our nation. And, and that is very flattering. And I'm very proud and humbled by this kind of recognition and it's really because of the great work that we do in Kansas city with this, this great museum known as the Negro leagues baseball museum, which has afforded me this opportunity to get in front of so many people and try and build a case for support of this organization and help people understand the life lessons that stem from this story. This story is so much bigger in the game of baseball, Mark. It, it, it really sure is. is. You're absolutely it's right. A profound and, story. Absolutely, and that's why that's one of the reasons why I wanted to chat with you this morning. Because for those of us who listen, and I record this and put it on my YouTube channel as well, so folks, I have a chance to go back and listen to it if they didn't catch it this morning. But it is critical because for me, it is always astonishing for me 
in terms of the contributions that we as African-Americans have made that have been intentionally and consciously left out of history. And whenever you start talking about the league and the great folks, when you start talking about Satchel Paige, you're talking about Jackie Robinson, you're talking about Larry Doby, you're talking about Cool Papa Bell, you're talking about, I mean, when you start going, and they, can you imagine, because the league did transform when uh, Jackie and um, Larry entered it, because it, respectively National League, American League, the league did change as more and more, but can you imagine how competitive and great oh. and interesting oh. the league would have been had all those players been in there? Oh, my goodness. You know, we can only wonder what if. But we wonder what if with, I think, full understanding that had the doors open sooner, the record books would be entirely different. Correct. And you can base that on the success of what happened after 1947. And as I tell our guests at the museum all the time, they didn't learn how to play baseball after 1947. Right. They were playing great baseball well before 1947. And when you look at the track record, one, uh, and to me, one of my favorite facts about the early integration of our game, from 1949 through 1959, nine of 11 National League most valuable players were former Negro League stars. Now, we haven't even mentioned rookies of the year. We're talking most valuable players were former Negro League stars. And let's keep in mind the American League was so slow to integrate. Right. The American League really did not want to break its labor practices and bring black players into the fold. And then, you know, constant, you know after constant pressure, they started to relent and open their doors. And so Elston Howard who is there in that neck of the woods of yours as well. He is, matter of fact. Would he, become, he, that's yeah, right. Would become the American League first MVP some years later. And the Yankees were one of the last teams to integrate. Correct. You know, Boston was the very last team. Uh, and, they, and Boston integrates 12 years after Jackie Robinson breaks the color barrier. So this wasn't something that, that the door opened and black folks just ran on in to the major league. This <laughs> right. was a very slow, right. ridiculous process that played out over 12 years. And so there was so much talent in the Negro Leagues. And a lot of that talent, by the time the integration of the game occurred, they were just simply too old now. And, and so they never got that opportunity to showcase their skill in the major leagues. But I can tell you this, the Negro Leagues wouldn't take a backseat to any league. Right. The talent that was right. there in the Negro Leagues was as substantial as any league. The only difference between the Negro Leagues and Major League Baseball was simply money. Major League Baseball had more money. But from a talent standpoint, uh-uh. No, no. We're talking about some of the greatest black and Hispanic athletes to ever play this game. Absolutely. I, I don't doubt that a bit. As a matter of fact, you just said Elston Howard. Elston Howard is buried in walking distance from where my father is buried. They're in the same cemetery. Um, oh, wow. So I can actually visit Elston Howard's grave when I go see my father's grave. Um, they are in walking distance from each other in the same yeah, cemetery. Uh, Ellie, Ellie played here for the great Kansas City Monarchs. And my, my dear friend, the late great Buck O'Neill, was his manager when he was with the Monarchs. And, and Ellie and Ernie Bates. The great Ernie Banks used to be roommates when they played for the Monarchs. Wow. And see, interestingly, like I told you, I have the I actually have Jackie Robinson's Monarch jersey, the number five. That's what it is. So again, every yeah, time every yeah. time I wear it, I have because first off, I'll ask people, you know, first, do you know what it is? A couple of people thought it was, you know, Kansas City University. Is that is that the is that the Chiefs? <laughs> is that the are you a Chief fan? I say like, no, no, no. This is not the Chiefs. <laughs> so uh, no, it, it's amazing one, and and I love the opportunity to educate because I also have a Newark Eagles cap as well. That's the two caps I have because I'm up here in this area. So I had a Newark Eagles cap, and then I ordered the Black Sox cap. Um, but it is amazing, again, from an educational standpoint to be able to, you know, to have the conversation. I remember as a kid, Billy D. Williams and Bingo Long's Traveling All-Stars. <laughs> yep. <laughs> How yep. well or not well did they depict the experience? Well, it was a fictionalized film based on a fictional novel by the same title. Right. But the film is very important. 
Now, to be frank, the Negro League players hated the film. Okay. They didn't really, uh, they didn't really understand it, Mark. Because you have to understand, these players from the Negro Leagues were very proud individuals. And, and so they didn't do all that shucking and jiving right. and parading in the towns and that kind of thing that you saw in the film. But the Indianapolis Clowns did do a lot of that. And so when Motown produced this film, and I hope if, you, if you're listening to the show and you haven't seen Bingo Long, Traveling All-Stars, and Motor Kings, do, your fav- do yourself a favor. Try to find it on Netflix or wherever you do your streaming or rent the video because it is a cult-like film. It is very important. Right. Because this was really the first cinematic portrayal of the Negro League. And it starred an, uh, an all-star black cast. You know, as you mentioned, the great Billy D. Williams, James Earl Jones, and the comedic genius Richard Pryor. Correct. All in this film with a litany of other great black stars who were in this film. This is a 1970s, early, early to mid-1970s film produced by, by Barry Gordy and Motown. And interestingly enough, if you read the book, Billy, Billy D. Williams' character was actually the catcher in the book. Right. But you have to understand that Billy D. Williams was just coming off of the blockbuster film Lady Sings the Blues. Correct. Uh-huh. And, and the women were in Billy D. Williams. You That's know, right. Billy D. Williams <laughs> looked a good-looking guy, and, and there was no way that you're going to put Billy D. Williams in a catcher's mask for right. three quarters of the film. Because <laughs> if I remember correctly, James Earl Jones played the catcher. They switched poor James Earl Jones. Okay. Yeah, I guess they say, well, James, you know, you got a great voice, but you ain't much to look at. So we're going to move Billy D into this role and put him on the mound where everybody can see Billy D. But, you know, and so it was loosely based on the Negro League. So, you know, Billy D. Williams' character captures the spirit of Satchel Page, And James Earl Jones' character is somewhat reminiscent of Josh Gibson. And, of course, Richard Pryor just Richard Pryor, man. Right. And, and there were a lot of guys who did indeed try to pass themselves off by speaking a broken-down Spanish because it would allow them possibly to get a meal in a town where otherwise they couldn't get a meal in that, pl- in that place or in that town. And, and I think the irony of that is here you had folks who were as American as anyone who were being treated as un-American as anyone to the point that you'd have to pass yourself off by being for, from another country in order to try and get basic services in this country. And, and so, but the film is really, really important, and it is hilarious, and it does kind of highlight some snippets of, but it was based on a fictional novel. And and see, it's interesting. And now that now that we've had this chat, I may very well today pull that movie back up and watch it again. I loved it as a kid. I really did. And, 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 and the, the the owner, the female owner in the film, that's based off of Effa Manley, who was right there in Newark, in your neck of the woods. She and her husband owned the Newark Eagles. Oh, and after, okay. And after Abe Manley passed away, she ran the ball club. And she knew the business of baseball as well as any man. And so the Newark Eagles, led by Ethan Manley, had some tremendous talent to play for her. Wow. Monty Irvin. My dear friend, the late, great Monty Irvin. Larry Doby. Leon Day. Willie Wells. Biz Mackey. These, these players are all in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. The late, great Don Newcomb should be in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. They all played for Ethel Manley's Newark Eagles. And so she's the first woman to be nominated and inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame at Cooperstown. And so not only did the Negro Leagues create opportunities for black and brown, they also opened up opportunities for gender. And, and, and in, in its own way, created a level of gender equity that Major League Baseball had really not even attempted to do. And see, it, something you said a couple of minutes ago, and, and it happened to us just about every, regardless of organization, because it certainly happened to us with the military in terms of us fighting and serving there and then coming back home and being treated again like less than an animal. 
But that's what was going on in, in the baseball league, where particularly whenever uh, Jackie and Larry broke into Major League Baseball, they still had to go to the back door. They still had mm-hmm. to, I mean, you played a wonderful game. You hit the game-winning home run or whatever, and now the game is over. Now you're back into, you know, you're less than an animal again. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, you know, yeah, you touched on something. If we were going to look at any single event, that helped usher in integration in our sport, it would be World War II. And it's for the reasons that you just mentioned. Here you had young black soldiers dying, fighting the exact same racism in another country that we're being asked to accept here at home. And that started to build the sentiment, well, if they could die for the, fighting for their country, why can't they play baseball in this country? And, and that is what really gave Branch Rickey the necessary wherewithal to make the move to try and bring Jackie Robinson away from the Kansas City Monarchs. That jersey you're wearing is his number five home jersey. Right. The year that he spent in the Negro Leagues. And a lot of people don't know that Jackie Robinson's illustrious professional career began in Kansas City with the great Kansas City Monarchs. I think people think that Jackie just walked out of nowhere. Right and started playing for the Brooklyn Dodgers. But his real, his real rookie season was 1945 here. And, and that's what I tell our guests all the time. Before he was number 42, correct, he was number five uh, for the great Kansas City Monarchs. And, and I watched the Jackie Robinson music, a movie, and Chadwick Boswick did a wonderful job playing him uh, in, in the film. And, and again, that story is absolutely something else. First off, you know, as you watch and everything that they went through, and you just said earlier in the beginning of the interview that none of them were bitter. Um, I'm always interested in the fact that even major league ball players now, in comparison to when I was a kid watching in the 60s and 70s in terms of salary, I'm surprised they're not bitter because you're talking, <laughs> you're talking 15, 20, 25, 30, 40 thousand dollars a year for a player uh, versus that's what players make now in one game. Oh, so, yeah. So. yeah. Now, and, you know, I used to talk to my friend Buck O'Neill about that. And he never had, you know, no disappointment. Uh, because what they understood, Mark, was that they set the stage for this to happen. And right. when they played, you know, the owners had all of the control. It didn't matter how good a season you had. They had full control. Right. And you had so many players there in the ranks who were just wanting to come behind and take your job if you didn't want your job. <laughs> and so you had no leverage. You had no leverage whatsoever. Right. And now, you know, baseball has one of the strongest, you know, labor unions in the country with the Players Association led by my good friend, Tony Clark. And, and so things have changed dramatically. That's progress. And, but they knew they were part of that. And they, they, none of those players lamented uh, the fact that these guys, these young, young ball players can make so much money now playing this game. And, you know, I'm, certainly, I'm sure they certainly wish they all could have made more money, right. like all of us. When, and whatever we do in life, Correct. You know, we wish that we could have made more money. But they, they enjoyed what they did. They got to make their living playing the game that they love. And even against the backdrop of American segregation, and the hardships that came along with it, they never allowed that set of circumstances to kill the love of the game. Well, that's where, you know, and you kind of went where my next question in terms of that is, and they played, and not just, I mean, in just in baseball in general, at least over time since I've been watching it, it seems to have shifted, and I could be, maybe it's a bad perception, I don't know, but it seemed to have shifted from, I'm playing because, exactly what you just said, I'm playing because I absolutely love this game, to, you know, it's a business. That's where we've seemed to, to me, seem to have progressed more of to, you know what, it's a business and if I get traded, I get traded. If I stay on this team, because oddly enough, as I had on the Black Sox cap on the plane, it sparked a discussion about that in terms of when we were kids, we could name players the entire team because they stayed with the team for so long. Nowadays, because they get traded and move around so much, we can't keep track of where everyone is. (laughs) And so the the, the cap sparked that discussion. Yeah, no, no, you're right. I mean, that's the romantic nature of our sport is that we we want our stars to stay with the club that we root for for their entire careers, but what free agency did. And, and of course, the fact that ownership can trade a player pretty much at its whim uh, unless contractually you're able to put in things that say, okay, I, 
you know, I can only be traded if I choose to go to this team and not you. And that's thankful to Kurt Flood. Right. You know, who is another forgotten man who should not be forgotten. Kurt Flood is essentially the guy that opened up the door for free agency and in, in not only baseball, in professional sports in general. And, and if you're not familiar with Kurt Flood's Flood story, folks, I would tell you to go back, Google Kurt Flood, who was a great ball player, a great outfielder <clears throat> who refused to be traded from the St. Louis Cardinals to the Philadelphia Phillies, and he fought baseball's antitrust uh, law, and he almost won. He took his case to the Supreme Court and barely lost a contentious Supreme Court decision, but his stance is what ultimately brought in free agency in baseball and in a wider capacity free agency in our sport. Sad to say, Kurt Flood died virtually penniless. Right. Uh, and that is usually what happens. That person that walks in their conviction usually walks alone. And, and that is essentially what happened with Kurt Flood. Um, I hope that Kurt Flood will one day be inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame because he deserves to be there. But, yeah, so the guys really, they didn't begrudge the fact that the, the young athletes make a lot of money today. They were very excited and understood that they had a hand in helping create that platform. That's correct. Now, I've been, for me, you heard me say I had my Steelers mask on, but I've been a Yankees fan and a Steelers fan since I was 12. Uh, have not wavered. I'm not one of those Johnny come late or jump on the bandwagon when they win and jump off when they lose. I haven't wavered from those two teams. I really don't have a basketball team. However, I do remember back in, in terms of the Yankees, I could name you Chris Chambliss, Roy White. Uh, you were talking about Elston Howard. He was coaching first base for them at the time when Reggie Jackson joined them. Um, you know, um, I'm trying to think of a couple of the other outfielders that were out there. Willie Randolph on second. I mean, you were talking Greg Nettles on third. I mean, I could name the team. I remember when Thurman Munson, you know, was ultimately uh, killed in that plane accident. But I could name you the Yankees team, and I was the same way with the Pittsburgh Steelers. So I understood the point of now they're moving around so much, you don't know who is where. Uh, but again, the, the game has, has, has progressed, and that's why I'm so excited in terms of, okay, everybody for the most part knows you know, Major League Baseball. But back to where we started the interview in terms of now educating folks on the Negro Leagues. Talk a little bit about the various educational programs you have with the museum. Yeah, no, we are very excited. Number one, we're continuing to build traveling exhibitions so that we can take the story on the road. You know, Mark, I would love for everyone to come to Kansas City and experience the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. I know that that's not possible, but I also understand that the story is too powerful, too compelling, too meaningful, too inspirational to leave isolated in Kansas City. We want people to have access to this incredible story of triumph over adversity. And so we started building traveling exhibitions with that first exhibition that we talked about, Discover Greatness, that's on display there at the Yogi Berra Museum today. And we've continually, uh, we've continued to build traveling exhibitions so that we can tell unique stories that relate back to the Negro Leagues and take the, the story out on the road to give people an opportunity to be introduced to this story. But then here in Kansas City, we're creating dynamic educational programs that we think empower our young people and to have an opportunity to learn this history and then not only learn it, but make it relevant to what's happening in their world. So, you know, we have our art program called Project Retrace, where kids come into the museum, we introduce them to the museum, we provide them with reference materials, and then we send them back to their respective classrooms and say, okay, Tell us what you learned about the Negro Leagues through your art. And, and really, the concept here is not about the quality of art, but the quality of thought behind the art. But what we found was there are some tremendously gifted young people who are very skilled Correct. at art, and we were getting amazing pieces of work uh, that we were able to display and create little exhibits to showcase their works. And, you know, sad to say the schools are de-emphasizing these creative outlets Correct. like art in the schools because they have to focus so much on the standardized testing. Thing right. And it just drives me nuts. It absolutely drives me nuts. And so, for me, experiential learning is still the most meaningful learning for a young, people, for a young person, and they retain in that way. 
as opposed to trying to just figure out how to pass it. Yes, and then basically whatever it is that you are learning in the process of trying to pass that test, you forget. Uh, but And that's why I felt like it was important for us to create these extensions of the classroom. And so we have a reading program called Reading Around the Bases, where we literally bring kids into the museum at the, on the diamond where the, where the life-size statues are. And it's, it's always done with a diverse group of kids, and we read from Negro League-themed children's books, and every child gets a copy of the book, and it is signed by the celebrity reader. But we wanted to reinforce the importance of reading. And sometimes when you have people who you admire from afar demonstrating this skill, it makes you want to develop your skill. And it's important. If you cannot read, man, you're lost from day one. Now, so you, 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 go, you, you, you are yeah. my street now. I mean, in fact, the, the, this show is called The Reading Circle, and that's what it is, is to encourage people to read more. And you're absolutely right. And what you were just saying about the standardized testing, that's you and me both. And when I'm not doing radio, I'm an educator because I'm a principal of a school. Um, and I happen to be leading a school right now that's an all-boys school. It's a, it's a young men's leadership academy, and we try to do a lot of connecting to ethnicity and history to connect that with their self-esteem. And yes, you regardless if your skin may be dark or light, we were always great. And so you're absolutely right in terms of the school systems doing away with the art programs and the music programs. You're right on point there. So yes, everything you're saying is right on point. And for kids who, I mean, it's almost like... When I was a kid, I mean, I ate, drank, and slept baseball. I played Little League baseball. I played high school baseball. But in some respects, for some of our children, that love is not being developed and is not there. So the fact that you can now connect baseball and academics, that's a great thing. No, it really is. And it's a great way for us to bring kids into the cultural confines of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. And for our urban children, our black and brown kids, to be able to walk into an environment, and hopefully, for many of them, it is their first museum experience. Correct. And how beautiful is it for them to walk into an environment and see people who look just like them? Correct. And to see them in their full glory, you know, because there's nothing sad or somber about the story of the Negro Leagues, even though it is anchored against the backdrop of American segregation. Correct. This is a celebration. You see us in our full glory. You walk in there, man, and people are dressed immaculately going to those games. And you see the pride on the players' faces, you know, as they were pursuing and playing the game that they love. And you see not only ball players, but you see managers and owners and traveling secretaries and team physicians. They fulfill every role that you could fulfill in the, the game of baseball. And that's important. You know, when I was a kid, there were really no museums for me to go to right. where I saw people who looked like me. And, and thus, you know, you didn't really have an interest in wanting to go to those museums. And That's so right. I think we feel that void as well. That's absolutely right. And and I've been to Ken- There was a point in my career, because prior going into education, I was actually, I worked for uh, AT&T. And I was on assignment one time where I was in Kansas City for an entire year, once a month, every month. So I was out there and and now listening audience, some of the biggest stakes in the world (laughs) is in Kansas City. (laughs) They bring the cow to your table and you get to pick. (laughs) You get to choose which cow you want. (laughs) But I mean... Though I remember, and this is going back, you know, back in the 90s as well, like either late 80s, early 90s. But I remember it well because I, I went to Kansas City. I was working on a project and it took me out there once a month, every month for two or three days. And wonderful city. And, and now that because when I started looking at the museum, I said, I got to get back to Kansas City because I want to go to the museum myself. I, when I'm, I'm going to come out there just to go to I want to go to your museum. I want to go out to the Civil Rights Museum in um, Memphis. There's a couple of museums I want to go to. And I said I was also going to go up to Cooperstown one day and, and go to the, the national, I mean, the American, you know, the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame. But certainly I'm going to make my way to Kansas City at some point to come visit the museum. And you're right in terms of having children, because, again, our, our history and how we've taught has been so, for lack of a better term and no pun intended, so whitewashed. They don't realize that there was a league that spawned greatness. 
And yeah, no, it, and it was a great league. It was a great league. And, and the spirit of it, Mark, the spirit of this thing is the fact that, okay, you won't let me play with you in the major leagues. Okay, then I'll just create my own league. And that's how, and that's okay. what, unfortunately, because of segregation, that's what we had to do with everything. Because people will ask, I don't understand why you needed a historically black college and university. I don't understand why you needed an HBCU. I don't know, understand why you had to have a Negro League. Because you wouldn't let us play in yours. <laughs> so we created our own, and then this league would actually rise to rival, and in many cities across this country surpass, Major League Baseball in popularity and in attendance. They were actually outdrawing many Major League teams in their own all parts. And, and so it's that refusal to accept the notion that you're unfit to do something. I'll show you. Right. You won't let me play with you. I create my own. And, and of course, the Negro Leagues were formed here in Kansas City on February 13, 1920. So we're actually celebrating 101 years of the Negro Leagues. Now, black baseball began well before that, but the actual formalized Negro Leagues began in 1920. And it's just an amazing story of triumph over conquest. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, triumph over adversity. Correct. And, and so we, those stories are, I think, more important right now than ever before. I am sure. Do you have the, and I know you do, because, but I'm going to ask the question anyway. Do you have the opportunity to connect some of the players today to some of the players that are still alive from the Negro Leagues? Yeah, no, we, we were, I was just at the All-Star game last week, and my good friend CeCe Sabathia, who spends quite a bit of time in, in that New Jersey area as well, and, of course, former New York Yankee. And, right. You know, I got he got introduced to a, a player named Sam Allen, who is out of Richmond, Virginia. And, you know, there's a lot of pride that comes along with that. You know, it's sad to say that just not a whole lot of Negro League players left. But right. My friend Pedro Sierra, who is also there in the New, New Jersey area, one of the Cuban ball players that called the Negro Leagues home. And, you know, so these guys, the young athletes today have gotten a chance to meet them, and they are obviously very gracious with those former Negro League players, because particularly for the African American Hispanic ball player, these are your roots. You don't play this game had it not been for the Negro League, and there Correct. is no and if buts about it. And so, yeah, there is a a debt of gratitude that is owed to those who, as I like to say, built the bridge. No you know, question. In our we oftentimes celebrate the people who cross over the bridge. It's rare that we celebrate the people who built the bridge. And the Negro League Baseball Museum celebrates the bridge builders. All right now. And, and so, yeah, you know, last year we did a, a campaign called Tip Your Cap to the Negro Leagues. And it was beautiful to see all of these current and former major leaguers acknowledging the Negro Leagues on the occasion of its 100th anniversary by tipping its cap. And it was even more beautiful to see four U.S. presidents tip their cap in President Obama. President Clinton, President Bush, and President Carter all tipping their cap in recognition and in salute to the Negro Leagues. And uh, it, it was just special. It was special because these players, they, you know, they didn't think they had done anything terribly special, Mark. They were just playing baseball. Right. You know, they didn't think they had done anything special. They certainly didn't think about making history. Right. Uh, and so, you know, they didn't care about making history. They just wanted to play ball. <laughs> <laughs> that's right that and and in that and that love of the game they wound up making history that's absolutely they wound right. up making history they wound absolutely. up yep yeah. so now you just said something here you because cc sabathia um he just released a book he he just Beautiful released book. a book and i would love to get him on the show so i might have to network through you to get to him to see if he'd be willing to appear on the show to promote his new book yeah, no, CC is an amazing young man. You know, it's hard to say, you know, young man, he just retired, I guess, 40 years old now. But he, he is a student of this history. He is so appreciative. When he was with the Yankees, he right. was a frequent visitor to the museum. He is doing things now to use his celebrity to help raise money Correct. for the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum and greater awareness. And so I was in Denver with him last week, and we were part of an amazing panel discussion uh, that looked at the legends and legacies of black baseball. And of course, you can't tell the story of black baseball 
without our black folks in baseball without telling the story <laughs> of the Negro League. That's exactly and right. So, you know, I'm sitting there on a panel discussion with CeCe Sadathia and Ken Griffey Jr. and the great Ferguson Jenkins and my dear friend Latroy Hawkins, who pitched for 21 seasons in the major leagues. And, and, and I'm sitting on the stage with these guys wondering, why in the world am I up here? <laughs> <laughs> I know that's right, but but no, you were meant to be there, and I'm glad you were there. But uh, I'm serious in terms of CC. We'll have to talk it some while if I can. I would love because he has. I I caught him on a couple of the morning TV shows when the book first dropped. He has a story to tell because, like I told you, I'm a lifelong um, Yankee fan. Had no idea until the other day, whenever he said what was going on with him personally. Yeah, and that's what the whole book is about: trying to help folks. Look, if you need help, get out there and get some help. Um, yeah. But had no, I mean, I watched CC pitch and I had no idea. None. I mean, talk about covering up well and, and keeping that hidden in front of the public. Um, just had, at least for me, I had absolutely. So I would love to get him on to talk about that book because that's a story to tell as well. Um, so, you know, we might have to connect offline, see if we can if we can get him to call in at one Saturday morning. But I am so appreciative that you call because, like I said, I know I actually didn't. I wasn't on the air last week and I wasn't on the air week before because I was out on vacation. And I know I had scheduled your date prior to going and we had in contact. So when the phone rang this morning, I was thrilled. And this interview has been exactly what I was looking for uh, in terms of helping folks understand the, how viable and important the Negro League is to baseball. Not, I, I'm not even using the word was. Is to baseball. <laughs> Because, like you said, they, I mean, they were the forerunners. They, they were the fun. Now, oddly enough, because like I said, I've, I've bought a few items from the museum. I actually have my Bo Jackson uh, bobblehead. bobblehead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have the Bo Jackson bobblehead. I have my Black Sox cap. I have my mug. Uh, I already had a Hank Aaron commemorative 17, 715 bat. And, I, you know, I had said not long prior to him passing, I said, I'm going to meet Hank Aaron one day. I, it had come into my spirit. I said, I'm going to meet him one day. And then a couple months later, I saw that he'd passed away. I was like, oh. Uh, but I, 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 had, I, I was kind of like determined. I wanted to at least say hi to him or meet him one day because I, was, I remember as I sit here, my father and I were sitting on the couch watching NBC and Al Downing was the pitcher and Hank Aaron yeah. hit 715. I can remember it if I'm sitting there just like if I was watching a movie. And my father and I, both of us jumped up when that ball went over and we, I can still have, see him coming around the bases now. Because <laughs> even that was filled with the whole racism and the segregation. Oh, and they didn't want that Babe Ruth record broken. And, you know, he would tell in terms of what that experience was like for him and his family as he was getting closer and closer to the number. So just, just, just amazing stories to be Hold in terms of teams they started with. I mean, most people, I, don't, I can't even say most, many people have heard of Satchel Page. They understand, okay, Satchel was a great pitcher and so forth. Because you start talking like Cy Young Awards and all this kind of stuff, no question Satchel and all of them would have had those. Oh, no question. No question. No question. Matter of fact, the award would have likely been the Satchel Page. <laughs> that, that, <laughs> now, see, you read my mind because that's what was going on in my mind. You said what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> you said exactly what I was thinking. It went through the radio waves. <laughs> so I tell you what, this is, I told you, there's, there's a, a time in the interview where you get a chance to promote. You can promote, you can say anything with the exception of a dollar amount. But in terms of reach and how they contact you, the museum, oh, yeah. the traveling show, anything you want to promote at this point, I'm going to turn the mic off and you have the opportunity to do that. Well, I, I appreciate it, Mark. And, and if you're interested in wanting to learn more about the Negro League Baseball Museum, please visit us at our website at www.nlbm.com, and you can learn about what's going on at the museum, the great work that we're doing to preserve this precious piece of baseball and Americana, and to keep the legacy of the Negro Leagues alive long after there are no more Negro Leaguers left to attest to what this league was all about. And you can become a member of our organization. You can make a financial contribution if you so choose to. And as Mark has mentioned, you can buy your gear online. So you can get your Negro Leagues gear 
from our online gift store, and we would welcome having your support. But you can also learn about the various traveling exhibitions that are available, and maybe there's a way for us to bring an exhibit uh, to where you are so that we can bring the Negro Leagues and barnstorm all over the country with this story again. But, you know, we're so proud of what we're doing in Kansas City. Uh, and as I tell my guests all the time, the Negro Leagues Museum doesn't need to survive. It has to survive so that we don't lose this precious piece of baseball and Americana. I know that's right. Well, I thank you so much because, uh, folks, also, he's in Kansas City, which is on Central Time. So uh, it's 8 o'clock here. It's 7 o'clock there. When it was 7 o'clock here, it was 6 o'clock there. So. <laughs> <laughs> So I truly appreciate you rising early to join me. Uh, it's an early morning show that I do live. And, uh, and in, in many instances, I actually have guests calling from the West Coast. So it'd be like three or four o'clock in the morning there. But I always appreciate my guests who are in a different time zone, especially behind me. If you're ahead of me, well, it's not that bad. But if they're behind me, that could be a challenge. So I thank you so much for rising early because the interview was great. It was as educational as I wanted it to be. Uh, it will be on my YouTube channel. I will be uploading it. And for the archives, I'll get the links to you or I'm trying. Let me see. What was the? Uh, and I don't have my email in front of the young lady who scheduled this for us. Oh, and my assistant Joan Finley. Yes, tell tell Joan. I said thank you so much. Uh, tell yeah, her, give no, her my I, thanks. I, I will, and and I failed to mention for those of you who are on social media, you can follow me on Twitter at nlbmprez, uh, and the same username on Instagram. And please listen to my new podcast called Black Diamonds. That's that correct. Serious. Sirius XM Radio, the long-form stories uh, that we tell, the untold stories of the Negro Leagues. And so this, we're getting ready to start the second season. I believe the new episode for the second season starts on August 2nd. They're released every Thursday. You can get them anywhere that you download podcasts, so Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. And uh, it's been a lot of fun creating this program for uh, Black Diamonds. Well, again, I thank you. Tell Joan, thank you. And, and since I have her email, I'll send the links to her and she can get them to you. Okay. But it'll be the YouTube link and the MP3 link. And once you get them, feel free to share them however you like. They're going to be on all of my social media. As a matter of fact, the whole time we were talking, I was posting pictures of the museum as well as the paraphernalia and the players. I was posting them on all of my uh, Facebook, on Facebook. So um, if you want to follow me on there, I'm Mark A. Medley, M-A-R-C-A-M-E-D-L-E-Y. Uh, but everything, as we were talking, I was constantly posting pictures of the museum, pictures of you, pictures of the paraphernalia to again generate interest and education. Because absolutely. And we absolutely appreciate it as well. So again, if you I don't know if you want to go back to bed if you're an early riser, I don't know which way it works, but again, I'm so thankful <laughs> that you took the time. <laughs> and I will be in touch with you and Joan uh, again to get this stuff to you and, and who knows what, you know, since I'm in education and, and you're familiar with Patterson, you know exactly about Hinchcliffe Stadium. You're absolutely right. That's what they're in the process of doing. Uh, so who knows, you know, where I, I can sit after talking with you now, I consider you a friend. We're, we're good to go. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, I, I, I can't thank you enough for the opportunity and uh, we hope that people who will be listening to this show will make their way to Kansas City at some point in time and see this amazing place called the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. I know that's right. Well, with that said, have a wonderfully blessed day and again, my many thanks to you and I wish you nothing but the best Dr. Bob on the museum and getting that word out there about the contribution that we have made and continue to make to the world, not even just the baseball. Yeah, Mark. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. All right. Take care. Okay. All bye right. Now. Bye now.